So hello everyone, welcome to Waste Connect, connecting you with the art of data visualization and storytelling. My name is Sagar Kapoor. I'm part of customer success team at Tableau. So Waste Connect is your weekly Tableau community call, which highlights some best practices, tips and tricks. We learn from some of our Tableau champions, Zen master experts, how you can go ahead and improve your data visualization and storytelling skills. So all the sessions which are presented in Waste Connect are uploaded to our YouTube channel. Go ahead, subscribe to it. Some great content waiting for you. And just to share recently, we have 3000 subscribers now. So thank you to everyone who is passionate about as we are passionate about in going ahead, creating this particular content and sharing with you. Also, we have a LinkedIn group. Go ahead, subscribe to it, learn from each other, connect with each other and start your journey of data visualization and storytelling. Also, just to share, I have gone ahead and created a Tableau learning path. If you're interested, just go ahead, bookmark it. I will go ahead and share the link with you. It has everything to do with Tableau, starting from what are the resources you can go ahead and start with Tableau. What are some of the best practices? What's new in Tableau? What are some of the new features coming in Tableau? And also all the content with respect to some of our amazing community initiatives, which are data farm and leading. Go ahead, bookmark it and use it. You can download this particular visualization from Tableau public, modify it and do it, reuse it as you want to. And also try the Tableau quiz. It will help you out if you're preparing for Tableau certification or just want to go ahead and understand what's your level in Tableau. With that, let me go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. We have Evelyn Munster and Vignesh Suresh. So Evelyn is a data visualization designer. She has a background in media, art, software development, and data analytics. With over 12 years of data visualization experience in various industries, she is today a renowned expert for designing data products that go beyond the capabilities of dashboards, helping technology clients develop purpose-built apps that use and visualize data in order to support decision-making and navigating complex systems. She is constantly developing new methods and mental models of how to design with data. With that, I will hand it over to Evelyn to talk about Chat Doctor's first aid for miserable timeline. Evelyn, over to you. Thank you, Zerga. Thank you very much for this uh, nice uh, and kind introduction. Um, and hello, um, everyone here. Um, I'm really excited to uh, collaborate um, today with all of you, um, helping a miserable timeline to get a little bit better. So um, let me quickly tell, tell you that this um, presentation today is tool agnostic. So I'm pretty aware that we are here on the Tableau community and of course you can apply, I hope, like everything. <laughs> I'm showing you here also in Tableau because Tableau is quite flexible, but of course you can ex um, apply it to all the tools. Yeah, it's just um, general design strategies, right? All right, so let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, I believe we can see us. Okay. okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, today we are gonna look at um, a miserable timeline and see how we can help. Yeah. So let me introduce you to this poor thingy. Oh, it's not working. Okay, to this poor thingy. Here you have this um, timeline we are going to work on today. And um, for those that are not familiar with online marketing, it's a um, real life um, timeline out of uh, real cases of online marketing. And um, what does it mean? We have two metrics here, impressions and RTB CPM. What are impressions basically? Imagine you have an ad that goes online, is placed on kind of, uh, of a website. Yeah. Then you want to count how often it is actually viewed by actual 
human beings. And this is called impressions, yeah? And you want to count this. And um, on the other side, you want to see, uh, keep an eye on your costs. So CPM is the cost in euros per 1,000 ad views, right? And um, the author of, his, of this uh, timeline somehow wanted to keep an eye on both of this and see the development over time, right? However, um, I guess you always, um, <laughs> you also um, come across these types of charts and I must admit that I also um, built a lot of these charts um, at the beginning of my career. <laughs> And I'm also guilty for this. Um, maybe you are too, so you shouldn't be ashamed. Just um, watch and listen. Um, what are the problems with this chart? So I'd like you to go on and spot issues you would um, do differently. You would have an issue where you would have problems here or questions. And yeah, go ahead and put this in the chat. So I'm not sure if I can view the chat window. Hmm. Kind of gone. Um, see, ah, Tim, labels on lines. Um, yeah, clearer formatting of dates. Yeah, the dates are kind of. Um, yeah, not nicely formatted. This is a clear labels on lines. Um, would be nice, yeah, to um, have direct labeling. I think this is what you mean. Um, that's a great idea. Does anybody else have um, kind of issue? Maybe key highlights. Yeah, Tim, this is really great. You scored 100 points. Uh, right now on the chart of the data with challenge, because um, I think this is the most important thing that you want to make clear what the message is. And it's not clear to me um, when I'm looking at this. Yeah, I'm totally to myself. Axes are not synchronized. Yeah, what do you mean with this exactly? Do you mean they are starting on different points, like not on zero? Yeah, probably. So um, this is also a great point. Axes are not synchronized. They are cut off. They're not starting at zero. Then um, how about colors? Yeah, do you have, like I, I personally have, I'm not colorblind, but I still have a hard time figuring out what line it has what color. Also, what a good, bad result. Yeah, exactly. So the message um, helping for interpretation, um, it's not there. So you're um, kind of relying on the expertise of your audience here. Two lines are overlapping. One could be a bar and one a line. I'm, I'm sorry, I really cannot read um, the whole chat. It doesn't just doesn't display here when I'm showing a screen. But I guess this is, yeah, you would um, suggest that this, uh, these are not just two lines, but one line and one bar to make it easier to distinguish them. Yeah, that's also a good point. They are overlapping and that's um, totally um, difficult to read. Yeah. What about the colors? Do you agree that um, they're difficult to um, distinguish? Yeah. Um, okay, so anyone else has an, an, another issue with this chart? Okay, so thank you very much for your really helpful input. And we are going to address each of your points and even some more right now. So let's dive into it. The first thing I'd like to address is the colors. This is really sad because my presentation is not really working with the key, with the keystroke, <laughs> but I can make it like this. Okay, so the, um, it's really important um, to be aware that color is difficult for a lot of people. 
uh, it's not just the colorblind people, which uh, are um, around 9% of the general population, but also the elderly people. So the older you get, the more difficult it is to discern um, color actually. And also for normal people, it gets really difficult to see color if the area is really tiny as it is here. Yeah. So what can you do with this? The first thing is you can just remove the legend and um, use direct labeling. Yeah. Put the labels directly at the lines. Uh, this is always, I think, the best thing you could do, but um, it's not always doable, right? Especially if you have dynamic data and the tool doesn't let you. But there are other strategies, like let's look into um, another one. Um, that's about the marks. Yeah, you can also use different marks. Here, I put it um, very simply. I just used um, a thin line and a thick line. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. Um, but you can also use um, like um, different symbols um, on top of these lines to make it even more clear. Um, another strategy would be to just um, make the areas bigger. Yeah, very simple. Um, yet powerful. Yeah, as you can see here, suddenly the colors pop out a lot more and it makes it um, uh, also for color blind or color deficient people easier to distinguish and also for the normal population, of course. Yeah. And um, the last thing about colors is the problem that we are using here um, red and green. So, especially red and green, this is um, for most of the color deficient people, exactly those uh, two colors that they cannot distinguish. Yeah? So, it's always better to not use uh, red and green. Instead, um, blue and orange is a much better choice. Right? So, don't use red and green, use uh, blue and orange. All right, so that's um, for the colors. Then we want to tackle the other things um, that you said that it's difficult to read the numbers um, because you don't see uh, where they are exactly on the line. Yeah, where is where is the twenty fourth? Where is the twenty fifth? If you only have like a couple of data points that we have here, you can or should always um, add dots like this. Yeah, that's really helpful, uh, makes it readable, um, pretty standard. And also use tick marks on the x-axis like this. Yeah. You can even use width lines, but that would make it, I think, in this case, a little bit too crowded. But um, yeah, that would be the, the third option you have. Yeah. Okay, now we have improved number reading. That was great, but um, yeah, we have tackled right now the low hanging fruits. Let's move to the more severe conditions of these charts. Yeah, the one that Saga mentioned is um, we have been cutting off both Y axis. Yeah, we have two axes. This is called dual axis uh, on the right, on the left, which, which is already complicated stuff to understand, but uh, both of them are cut um, arbitrarily. Yeah, they don't start at zero. Um, what the author wanted, of course, um, well, I can understand it, um, is that they wanted to zoom in to the chart um, to make the data easier visible. But especially if you have dual access, you cannot do this really, because what you're doing is you make this chart unreadable. It's uh, it's a bullshit chart. <laughs> yeah, um, you could better put the data in a table because here you cannot see anything. Why? Why? Um, I will explain it to you. So first, let's expand both y-axis scalings um, up until zero and see how it looks like. This is how it looks like, right? So what you see that um, both lines are basically distorted. Yeah, the whole axis is not only distorted, 
um, most of part of the ex, um, of the chart is not visible at all. Yeah, it's hidden below. And um, what's the problem with this? So starting, I can ask you, um, why do you want to compare here like apples with oranges? Yeah, you're comparing impressions with costs and you cannot even compare them really. Yeah, um, they have different units. Um, they mean totally different things. So why do you want to compare them uh, at the beginning? You want to compare them because you want to show correlations. Yeah, although these are like apples and oranges, you still can say, hey, whenever impressions goes down, um, CPM also goes down. So maybe I have a correlation here. Yeah? And this is exactly what you want to show. But when showing correlations, um, you can, um, when showing correlations, um, you want to see the rate. Yeah, like here you see on the 23rd to the 24th, we have a sudden drop. Yeah, and this drop seems parallel. So it looks like impressions uh, decrease, decreased at the same rate as CPM decreased. Yeah, but this is a misconception because if I'm um, pulling them apart and putting them on the axis where they belong, um, it actually looks like this, right? So here you suddenly see that the rate both dropped. Okay, but the rate was different. Yeah, CPM on the um, on the top dropped only per ten, per ten percent, uh, whereas impressions dropped by forty five percent. But it looked we go back. It looked like, yeah, it looked like the same, right? So this is uh, misleading, yeah? And um, how can we mitigate this? Of course, we want to um, start both axes at zero, and this is what it would look like in the normal chart, yeah? And here, I think this is pretty good for dual axis right um, right now, because now you see, okay, we have a correlation, but it's not the same rate. Yeah, you can clearly see the different um, the decreased rates. Okay, but there's another thing. Um, I'm not sure if you already mentioned it. The date format is not nice, but also, um, did you know <laughs> that, um, 88% of all neck injuries globally are caused by bad chart design. Yeah, <laughs> because you have to go like this for reading the dates, like this for reading the impressions label, and then like this for reading the other label. <laughs> That's not really nice usability and you should definitely avoid this, but how could you, could you do this? Yeah. Um, of course, um, we all see that you cannot fit the labels um, in here if you just um, put them horizontally, but there's always kind of a solution for this. So what I did here is just I omitted the year because often it's not important to have the year here. Still not nicely formatted, I have to admit. <laughs> and um, but sometimes it just doesn't work, even if you omit the year or do other things to shorten your labels. And um, for this, there's some other technique. You can just leave out every second label or even every third or how much you need to do until you have these horizontal labels. Yeah, I think that is nice for the users. All right, so we have another, still another issue. Yeah, so I personally have a general issue with dual access and I'm not alone with this. And I get you, if you want to compare apples with oranges, see um, correlations um, that you have the intuition of packing it in one chart because then you really have those lines like, yeah, side by side. The problem here is, however, that above or below has no meaning, yeah? The lines crossing each other don't have a meaning. We have, um, 
the um, impressions are above the costs and then they cross and they are below costs, what kind of statement is it? It's just, you know, BS statement. You cannot say this with, um, yeah, different metrics that are not, that do not share the same access scaling, right? The same units. It just doesn't make sense. You can show correlations, but you cannot say something is above or below. But we as humans perceive these patterns here. They are very strong and un, um, yeah, untrained uh, individuals might fall for it and still make any conclusions. Yeah, And it's really difficult to teach your eyes to ignore it. So um, do you have any idea how we could solve this, how we could uh, mitigate these uh, problems and um, when what we could do instead of these dual access. So I think um, I've read this before that you could use a scatter plot. Um, that is a nice idea because um, then you have um, not two lines but you have um, two sets of dots. You can color them differently. You don't have these overlappings. But then you, you of course, could have an overall trend very nicely here, even better than in our timeline, but um, you don't see this time development. Yeah, You cannot see this correlation, sudden drops or increases over time. I think that's more intuitive, better readable for with actual timelines. Um, Okay, so um, I'd say we want to pull them apart. And this is what it looks like. Yeah. So why, why pack everything into one chart? You can easily use the same space, the same height, and put two charts below and above each other. And as you can see, you can still see correlations, yeah, and all the relative differences of the correlations easily. But the big win you have here is not only avoiding the overlappings, it is also that you avoid these color codings. We can use a bar chart. Um, yeah, a scatter plot would um, cause correlation, not causation. That is also important that we don't derive causation if we just see correlation. But also, it's important to see correlation. Often, it's an indicator for causation, right? And uh, we have to check this if the business experts actually um, know what how to interpret this. Um, but what you're doing here is um, you avoid these color coding problems. As you can see here, I just used one color. I don't even have to use a color. I can use my default color. I can use grayscale. That makes it really calm, easy to read. No more yeah, seeing to what is what, what belongs to what axis, and still you make a point. Yeah. Um, there is, but there is also another problematic timeline, another miserable timeline here that is totally different. Here we have um, not a dual axis, but just a single axis, and it starts at zero. So very good, but still it's kind of cluttered. It's colorful spaghetti code because what you wanted to see here, you wanted to compare different items over time. So here these are campaigns and online marketing, that means I just don't have just one single ad, I have four different ads and I want to compare how they are doing over time, which ad went better or worse. And um, yeah, I know this is the standard way how to display it, but actually I'm not a fan of it because it's really cluttered, but often, yeah, it's not clear what you can do instead. And I want to show you two different things you could do instead. Um, so why, why put everything in one chart that you want to show? If you want to compare photos, yeah, you don't do it like this. Yeah, 
here I'm, I want to show you two different photos and compare how many trees are in each of these photos. It yeah, works perfectly. Of course not. Of course you want to do it like this. Yeah, of course. So why not just apply the same technique to charts? Yeah, this would look like this for the four campaigns. Again, you have the big win that you don't have to use different color codings and um, still you can compare the campaign side by side, I think really well and even better. So this technique is called small multiples. I love it. Um, I know it's also doable in Tableau. And um, if you're using the same y-axis scaling, that means uh, you can see here that each axis starts at zero and goes to 3000. Then you make those campaigns actually comparable. Yeah? If something is below, it's clearly that it's less than the other campaign. Yeah? So I personally love um, small multiples and um, I start seeing them more and more out there in the public in um, data journalism in the newspapers, in um, presentations, but I'm still missing them in B2B applications. Yeah, Whenever I, I come to see a um, dashboard or B2B application, people tend to stuff everything in one chart. And um, yeah, please go ahead and use small multiples in your own data visualization or think of using them. Um, I think that would make the world a lot better. Um, all right, but there's a second um, technique. Maybe uh, let's go back. Maybe you say, yeah, that's not the right thing because actually I want to compare my own comp uh, campaign, which is the campaign A, against all other campaigns out there that we have at the company and use um, the other uh, campaigns as a benchmark. Yeah, because my client needs to see how they were doing uh, compared to the rest of I don't know, the industry. And um, for this use case, do you have an idea how we can solve that one? We can also use filters to view different campaigns. Yes, I th yeah, yeah, that's that's a good thing. So then you would choose or click on one campaign and the other ones would be um, muted kind of. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So um, what we can do is um, I call this the campaign strategy, uh, the benchmark strategy um, is like this. Yeah. You can use filters, but you can also, if you know already which campaign you are concentrating on, you can just do it like this, really static. Um, make your campaign in a color and assign really this gray, transparent, um, light gray color to all the others. Yeah, so that really lets the campaign A stand out, pop out, and um, you can still use kind of uh, hovering or tooltips for all the other campaigns um, if people really want to know what they are, if need be, right? All right, so um, I think we have addressed most of the conditions of um, a timeline, but we still haven't yet talked about the most important one, and you mentioned them already, um, the message, yeah? Um, here already you can say this kind of a message, but still don't underestimate how often your audience just doesn't know what message you want to convey. Yeah, it's not always clear and it's always helpful if you kind of um, can do it. And I know <laughs> from my own experiences, especially if you have dynamic data in dashboards that changes like every day or for every user, um, you cannot really um, see the message for yourself and that's why you just cannot write it um, on the headline, like maybe in data journalism, this is the case, or in a presentation. But even for us dashboarding uh, BI uh, data product people, <laughs> you can still at least think about the important things and um, kind of concentrate on these. Yeah. So for timelines, there are a couple of um, different things that you 
might want to show. Yeah. So we have, for example, targets. Yeah, people are comparing. Um, yeah, dynamic titles can help. Yes, of course. Um, that is uh, really like great if you can do this. But if you just show, um, yeah, we are comparing impressions versus CPM, that's of course not a good title. Yeah. But if you tr um, can um, write something like this, um, the uh, impressions and costs correlated somehow or didn't correlate at all, something like this. But um, this you, you can already guess is a lot of work and often it's not doable. But we can also um, target the visualization itself and say, so what is your user, your business user actually wanting to see what's their data questions they have and can I kind of answer it more clearly? So here, look at this. We have a couple of different um, use cases actually for timelines and maybe there are even more. So we have targets. Sometimes people have targets or goals and they compare the actual um, values against them. So, or we have trends or we have variation that is interesting for us or we have anomalies and outliers we're looking for or we look at correlations or patterns. Yeah, you see, these are a lot of different things and um, everything can be done in with a timeline. If you just so show the timeline with no comments at all, that um, is often not helpful for people um, unless they're really proficient and know exactly what you're, they're looking for. But even if it is like this, it's also helpful for them to have them like the target displayed. Yeah? You can display targets like this, for example, just yeah, displayed as a line in your chart. Similar, you can display trends. So sometimes they don't have a target, but they want to see if they have improved. Yeah, did we improve in the last year? So it's a wiggly line, it goes up and down, but in the end we have improved by 3%, which may be huge. So show this in your line, make it really clear. Um, or we could um, look at variation. Yeah, sometimes, um, the exact values are not that uh, a problem, but the problem is that it varies too much. Yeah. And you want to get it more steady. This is your goal. And then you can show this variation by showing the confidence interval of the whole time span. Yeah. So immediately you stress this out and uh, let the user see by um, that the confidence interval shrinked, which is great in this case. Yeah. You can, of course, um, um, highlight the your outliers, anomalies, yeah, that the system has detected. And um, um, if you are, if this all this time is just about spotting outliers, then highlight it, please. Or patterns, yeah, especially in the timeline we had at the beginning with these uh, impressions and costs. It typically changes a lot um, on the weekends. Yeah. So people always spot for weekend versus weekday. And um, our timeline wasn't really nice and helpful because just um, displaying the date, you don't see the weekends. So maybe you, sh you should would color the weekends or something like this. And um, last but not least, yeah, spotting correlations with multiple timelines as we did before. You can, um, yeah, if you use um, this small multiple technique, um, you can even use not just two different metrics on two axes, but you can <laughs> use endless uh, amount of different metrics um, below each other and you can neatly show correlations, um, let the system detect it automatically and then, yeah, highlight it like here in kind of Kind of boxing them, yeah. So this is um, just a couple of um, things you can do with um, timelines, and maybe this uh, was helpful for you. The next time you're building it, before you start, just stop yourself and think of, yeah, um, 
what can I do? Uh, what, what is the main message? What want I to show or to see um, my users, right? Okay, so um, the most important thing is highlight your message, of course. And yeah, I think that's it. Um, thanks a lot for watching. We have now a happy timeline. And um, if you like this and um, if you want to learn more, you can um, head over um, to my um, Chart Doctor Data Design Academy over at chartdoctor.com. And uh, because I have launched a new course um, that's called Iconic Data Design, and it is not just general about data visualizations, but it's, it's especially and only for data um, product teams working on B2B um, data products. Yeah, that could be BI dashboards for internal users, but also for clients where you have a whole team really working for a weeks or month on something. And um, you maybe feel that it's not just enough to know how to visualize data, but there are so many more questions like how to deal with colors, with the eye colors, um, how to spot, um, really understand the user problems and how to translate the user problems in actual visuals. All this stuff, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much for listening, and um, I'm really sorry because. Um, oh, Tim, you're German. Lieben Dank. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I just um, didn't get all of the chat because um, I didn't see the chat actually. Um, so maybe um, if you have um, Saga, if there's still. Um, of sharing if there's still open questions we can address them like now sure uh, first of all i just want to thank evelyn for you to go ahead and just talk about this whole process right of creating a beautiful timeline and making it simple so thank you for sharing for that and i will recommend everyone just go to evelyn's chart academy and just go ahead and register for for the courses because data visualization and storytelling it's a creative process, right? And this is something you have to go ahead and invest in it. So thank you. Thank you, Evelyn, for sharing all those best practices with us. So if you have any You're question welcome. for thank Evelyn. You. Yeah. Uh, if you have any question for Evelyn, just go ahead and put it into the chat. So once our uh, other speaker, Vignesh, completes his session, then we can go ahead and answer it. So without further ado, I will now hand it over to Vignesh. And before that, let me introduce him. So Vignesh is doing master's in information technology from University of Mumbai in India. He loves Python and he came across this tool called Tableau in 2020 lockdown and he has found the tool very interesting. Learning from visits created by people is what motivates him and it opens new doors for him to think better than before. And we will also go ahead and share the blog which he has created so I'm excited to go ahead and learn from Vignesh about how you can go ahead and create a semi Coxcom charts in Tableau. So Vignesh, over to you. Share screen is not visible. Ah, now it is visible. Thank you so much. So the screen is visible? Uh, yes, Vignesh, please go ahead. Okay. So, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Sagarson, for that uh, introduction. So, yeah, I'll uh, uh, introduce myself uh, again. Like, I'm pursuing research in information technology. Uh, from, Vignesh, like, uh, sorry, technology. sorry to. Sorry to disturb you. Your voice is cutting in between. Like, do you? Are you? Yeah. Just use it without the headphone. Yeah. Please. please okay. Ahead. Thanks. So yes, uh, I'm pursuing my masters in information technology from the University of Bombay. Uh, yes, I'm also a keen lover of Python programming, and I discovered Tableau in 2020 lockdown and found the tool interesting uh, and also I have participated in Tableau community initiative and yes I am also 
very glad and happy to say that now I am also uh, in the group of the BOTD because I recently uh, got a BOTD this week. That is the first BOTD was mine. So if you are interested, you can go and check it out. It is there in my Tableau public page. So yes. So yes. So first thing we have to understand is what is Coxcomb charts. So Coxcomb charts. The first thing you have to know that it is called as a polar area diagram. Then it is also called as a rose chart. Now, if you uh, say rose chart, you can think of a rose. The rose flower is having more petals, right? It is not like uh, all the petals are not synchronized. They are nothing but some are up, some are down, right? Some are folded, etc. Then uh, Florence Nightingale, this lady, was a statistician performer who first used this chart to communicate deaths of soldiers during Crimean War. So, if you might have, if you might be aware that Coxcomb chart is also called as a Florence Nightingale chart. So, why it is called as a Florence Nightingale chart is because the statistician uh, actually introduced this chart I and mean, used this chart to communicate deaths. Then. In Coxum chart, if you see, you can think of a pie chart, but the main difference is in pie chart, uh, the summation comes up to 100%. But in Coxum chart, the summation is always more than 100% or it is less than 100%. It is not equal to 100%. That's why if you see in pie chart, the circumference of the circle, right, it is going, it is always touching each other. But in the case of Coxcomb chart, the sectors would definitely touch, but the circumference of the circle would not touch. You can try it yourself if you like. Then the fourth point says each category or interval in the data is divided into equal segments on this radial chart. So we are not being biased over here. Every category or interval in the data would be divided into equal segments. So every category would get equal segments. Next. Yeah. So, some of the examples from the community which I have seen is uh, the first example is from uh, Harpreet Duman. Uh, he has created this Coxum chart for uh, BSP, that is the this for social good. Then we have Tableau, the master two on form. Uh, he has a, a tutorial on how to create it. Then comes uh, Ruth A, that is Ruth. Uh, Amartyo from the data school where she has the template and she shows you how to uh, edit it. Then we have Carlo then Master Lindsay Bessendel who has created uh, this visualization. We have Ben Florlet who is Carlo then Master and he has the template uh, on his portfolio page. And last but not the least is Mr. Vincent Bormel who has created this visualization. Now, sorry, yeah. So, what is a semi Coxcomb chart? Now, if you see, semi means it is half. So, a Coxcomb chart which I showed you was full circle, but semi means it is half. So, creating a half Coxcomb chart is what I'm going to show you. Okay. So, yes, uh, we'll, okay, for that, uh, So yes, for that we need a simple data set. Sir, uh, Excel sheet is uh, seen, right? No, no, Vignesh, we are not able to see your Excel sheet. I think you have to go ahead and share the entire screen from the WebEx rather than just sharing the application. Do you want to share it again? Just share it again. You might be currently just sharing your PowerPoint. That's the reason we are not able to see your Excel. Okay, okay. Share. Share. My screen. Yep. Share entire screen. Yeah, you can see, Correct. right? Yeah. Okay. We can see now. Thanks Please. so much. Um, yeah, so for this, we need a simple data set that is uh, having this category and value. So we 
going to import this into Tableau. So uh, have this Tableau public uh, the desktop version where uh, I will import it in front of you, right? So new data source uh, Excel. Um, So now you can see the data set over here. Now for this, we have to union the data set. So how will you union it? It's simple, you just drag the sheet one onto this and you can see this union option coming here. You will union it. And, uh, after union it, you will get these two columns, that is sheet and table name. You can exclude the sheet column if you like, but this table name is needed because it is going to be used in some calculation. So, I have already done this. Uh, this case, uh, and talk to me, it's the same thing. Now we are going to uh, do some calculations. We need some calculations. So first thing is cal one category index. It is basically telling you to invoke the index function. Then uh, one increment index. Uh, it will tell you to. Uh, it is used to show the numbers of the increments in the padding in each segment. So for that also you are going to use uh, index function. Then uh, the third thing is one segment index is also using the index function the numbers to each the uh, I mean it is used to give number to each segment in the circle. Then it is uh, two hash increments Two hash increments. Uh, I have taken one uh, figure that is 102. Now this 102 is very important. Yeah, you can uh, increase uh, your, thing. you can increase this value or you can even uh, lower it up. It's your choice. But whatever value you put here, it has to be put somewhere else. So you have to that. Then uh, two hash segments. Now two hash segments takes the calculation that is window max of one category index. It is for the number of categories. Then it is called as C segment angle. C segment angle uh, is a calculation with pi. So yeah, it's a calculation with pi which tells you one segment index minus one into two into pi the whole divided by window max one segment index. Now this is the calculation. Next is four radius. For four radius we're going to take the square root or average of value divided by two pi. Now here the two pi which I showed you in the three segment angle also is basically telling you that you're going to create a coxswain chart. So two pi means 360 degree, right? And we have this tool tip uh, which tells you that you have to do this calculation that is window max of sum of value. Yeah. Then we have to have this pad calculation. Now in this pad calculation, I told you that table name is important. So the calculation says if table name equal to sheet one, then your uh, value should be one else the value should be 102. So uh, in the earlier case, I showed you my calculated three, which had 102 as a value. So this and that should match. And now the favorite of everyone, that is X and Y. So this X calculation is so big. But the uh, only thing to remember here is that for X, you need to use the cost function. And yeah, so you need to worry about the calculation. Uh, everything is there in my blog. You can just copy paste it if you like. And for why it is also the same, but only thing to remember is uh, you have to multiply here with 100. In the earlier case, it was not. And uh, yes, it is going to be the same, but uh, you are going to use sign function. Now, this comment I did not change, uh, I kept it the same. So, this comment has not got nothing to do with the calculation over here. So yeah, so the calculation is done. Now we are going to create bins. So for this pad, I will create a bin. And bins. So uh, I have already created a bin. You have to keep this the size of bin as one and then say, okay, the bin will be created. Now how to create this? 
So very simple. We'll drag x two rows. We'll drag y two columns. Then uh, we'll drag the category to color. We have to choose the mask type as polygon. So you have to remember. And uh, yeah, and then this tag bin. We'll drag it to columns shelf. This arrow mark. You have to click, and you have to see that show. Missing values is checked. If it is not, you have to clear it. Check it. Then after checking, you can drag this tag bin to the path shelf. Now you don't see anything over here. It's because um, you need to edit some table calculations. So for that, I go to X, edit table calculations. Now uh, for X, compute using specific dimensions. And I choose tag bin. Now tag bin should be at the top. Then for one increment index specific dimensions tag bin. The third that is the segment angle specific dimensions. Now you have to check category and keep category at the top. Then four is one segment index. You have to choose category and keep the category at the top. So fifth one is two hash segments. Now here you will check both, but you have to keep tag bin at the top. Now this is a point to be noted here. You have to keep tag bin at the top over here for two hash segments. And for one category index, you have to use specific dimensions and compute using category. You will keep it. You will keep category at the top. Now whatever I did for X. I am going to do the same thing for Y. Let's do it. Specific dimensions. Y. Specific dimensions. Back then. Different index. Yeah, as you can see, your Gaussian chart formation has taken place over here. Then three segment angle. This category. Segment index, then again category. For two hash segments, specific dimensions, it's going to be category and tag, but you have to keep tag at the top, I told. Then for one category index, it is going to be category. Done. So your costume chart is ready. So you can do a little bit of formatting, sorting, etc. Uh, now you have to drag. This uh, calculated field that is the uh, tool tip into detail. You can also drag it into tool tip, but I am dragging into detail. Then click on this arrow and then compute using tag bin. So that's it. Now you can see your calculation. Uh, after doing some formatting, it will look something like yeah, it will look something like this. It's the same thing. Uh, yes. So now the question will be like, what is semi Coxon chart? So semi Coxon chart will look something like this. The only thing is, I have changed the angles from two into pi to just pi. Now, if you if you see, circle is always associated with 360 degree. So circles half is semi circle. So that it is always half. 360 is half is 180. And if you know, there's nothing but a simple math. 180 degree is pi in variance format. 2 into pi is 360. So you have to just experiment uh, different formats. In this case, I have chosen pi. Wherever pi was involved in the calculation, I did it with pi, and you will end up with this resulting graph. So next is you can even go and create your dashboard. Uh, Highlight action. So you can just highlight it. Yeah, so all the calculations which I showed you is available in my blog. You can check out if you like. Even the blog link is there here in my workbook. I will uh, upload it. And then, uh, if suppose you are able to do this, then you can go to the next level by making something like this. Here, the only thing is I have the data set. Uh, 
Okay. Here in this data set, if you can see, I have this additional column known as matrix. So this matrix has two values, A1 and B1. So the same thing, uh, procedure is the same for uh, constructing this. This is one variation and this is one variation. But the only thing is, whenever you are uh, editing the table calculation, you have to even check your matrix. But in this case, you will keep your category at the top and matrix will be down. It will not be at the top. In this case, you will keep the matrix at the top and the category will be down. So if you are not able to understand what I'm telling, you can just see the part here. Uh, the A is nothing but the category, but you have two values for it. It has uh, two groups, you can say A1 and B1. And in this case, you can say that you have this uh, A1, but uh, A1 is nothing but the group. And in this group, you have all these values of different categories. So this is one variation, and this is another variation. So, yeah. This is nothing but the making of the costume chart and semi costume chart. I will go back to my PowerPoint. Yeah, now what you can do is you can create a parameter with four values that is 90, 180, 270, and 360. You create a calculated field and map that parameter to the calculation because you know one parameter is useless without a calculated field right? If it is done properly, then you can see that your costume chart will update according to the angle specific. So for that, you have to keep your parameter as a filter and you can just check if you like. Now the hint for that is you can watch uh, Andy Kribble's video on YouTube on custom sorting using parameters. And also you can even uh, do something like uh, you can create four uh, images and uh, use them as filters, that is 90, 180, 270, and 360. Create four charts, use parameter, and then you are good to go. For that, you have to see Andy Kribble's video on choosing a chart type with icons. So, yeah, these two uh, hints I have given. You can try it for yourself if you like. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's me. Uh, you can follow me on Tableau Public, Twitter, LinkedIn, etc. So it's me signing off. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Viknesh. And thank you for sharing all the best practices around creating a Coxcom chart and semi Coxcom chart. And I think you are an inspiration for everyone how you have gone ahead and got your first this of the day so many congratulations for that also so it's inspiring I us i think yeah that is one thing we are always looking to go ahead and learn from you so with that if you have any questions for evelyn or vignesh just go ahead and put it into the chat and happy to ask them so vignesh hanumant is asking how do you read this chart and what information is contained you want to give example maybe a quick one minute example Uh, I didn't get you. What was uh, what's the question? So uh, Hanumant is asking, like, what is the business? Like, how do you go ahead and read this chart, right? So maybe if you go back to your dashboard, and if you can talk about what are some of the insights the Coxcom chart or the semi Coxcom chart draws out when you go ahead and show it to a consumer. Um. I would say that uh, Coxcom chart is not much used in business scenario, you can try it for Tableau Public and you can just uh, explore what Tableau can give to you uh, by creating it. But if you are really uh, interested in doing for business, I would say that you definitely take feedback from uh, experts like the uh, masters or ambassadors and then uh, ask them and then only go forward to use it. I would say that. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Vignesh. And maybe, Evelyn, I want to go ahead and ask a question from you. 
how did your journey started with tableau right in terms of like have you gone ahead and participated in tableau community events how do you go ahead and learn about tableau ah good question daga um i'm actually um i think one of the first um uh, Tableau users. Um, I think I joined in 2008 and I recently got, got this swag, this, um, I don't know, uh, kind of thing that they distributed to them. So it was clear that I'm really long on the board. Um, but I never used Tableau as much as I uh, wanted to because um, I my specialty is I, I didn't plan to uh, have this, but this is just um, where all the clients came from. They were always, um, you know, building uh, data products from scratch um, with a development team and they are programming everything and they have data scientists on board and um, most of them, they are yeah, kind of um, um, thought about Tableau, but then decided um, in, in the other direction. Um, and um, so I have uh, more um, experience with B3JS which is totally flexible, okay. but it takes a lot of time <laughs> to, to realize this. And I am using Tableau more um, for a quick analysis when I go into a new project and um, I don't know the data yet and they're heading me some dummy data or example data or something they have. And um, I have a quick, uh, do quick some analysis or quick uh, a transformation even. Um, and make some quick jobs to see if, like, my ideas work or what's in the data, what kind of story is there. And um, then I typically go ahead and make scribbles and um, nice layouts in Figma or Sketch, and then it goes uh, to um, um, to development. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn, for sharing that. So I think we are already over time and I don't see any question which is there in the chat. So yeah, I think with that, uh, thank you, Evelyn, and thank you, Vignesh, for your time today on Visconnect. Thank you for sharing your best practices, tips and tricks for the community. And it was an honor to have you on Visconnect. Thank you very much, Saga, for hosting all this. Thank and so thanks for having me. And um, if you want to keep in touch with me, then you can just connect over LinkedIn because that's my platform where I be where I'm more more most um, active. Yeah. Perfect. So you heard from Evelyn. If you have any question for Evelyn, just go ahead and connect her with her on LinkedIn and also Vignesh on LinkedIn and Twitter and ask him what are the new projects he is working on and get some inspiration. So with that, thank you so thank much. You everyone uh, for... yeah. Thank you well, so much. Uh, I have, uh, I literally didn't uh, think that this session would be more Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, no problem, Vignesh. There is always a first time. So yeah, happy, happy to host you on this connect. Thank you for sharing your uh, journey of Tableau with us. So with that, thank you everyone for joining. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye bye.